simplest commodity form contains the whole secret of the money form and with it in embryo, all of the bourgeois forms of the products of labour. Now that we have an understanding of how value is expressed within a commodity through the average amount of time of society's collective abstract human labour embodied within it, Marx turns his attention to the relationship between the values of commodities in relationship with other commodities. Essentially, Marx here is explaining how we define what a commodity is worth expressed in relationship to what other commodities are worth. Let us again return to our abstract thought of space or complete blackness with no items, no money, no people. Just the commodities we'll use for our example. Only this time, we now know the value of our commodity. Let's take our football again. And for our example, we'll say the socially necessary labor time is one hour and call the value embodied within it one. Now let's also take our hat from the previous section, but we'll say the socially necessary labor time is only half an hour, half the amount of time to produce as the football. Now, because we have already accidentally established the value of our football as one, examine it in relationship with the hat, we can determine that the expression of value in the hat is half a football or half. Or we could say that the football is worth two hats. However, it's only because we can compare their relationship to each other that we can express their worth. If we were to remove the football from our example and pretend it never existed, the hat would have nothing to be compared against. Its value would essentially be one or technically zero, not half, because it would no longer be able to express its worth in relation to any other commodities. It's only this reflection of one commodity's comparison to another commodity that we can express their relative worth and relative value. The number of such possible expressions is limited only by the number of different kinds of commodities distinct from it. In the next two sections, Marx examines the relationship of a commodity not just against one other commodity, but against all commodities. So our football is now joined by everything else. For example, we can imagine its expression of worth and value in relation to our hat, our P, a bike, a house, a screw, a phone, and an endless amount of others that are continually growing and expanding as we produce more. If in the previous section we realise how the value of the football is reflected in its expressed relationship to all other commodities, here then the reverse also becomes true. All the other commodities' values becomes a reflection of their relation expressed in comparison to the football. We can also see how the other commodities' relation to each other is still expressed in this same relation, even if it's not at first obvious. For example, we can say that four peas are worth one hat, or one house is worth five phones. But we can only establish this worth of their value in relation to our original commodity, the football. Within this form, every other commodity now becomes a mirror of our football's value. No matter the type of commodity or quantity, they only find their expression of value in relation to each other, within their relative value of the football. The particular commodity with whose bodily form the equivalent form is thus socially identified now becomes the money commodity, or serves as money. It becomes the special social function of that commodity, and consequently its social monopoly, to play within the world of commodities the part of the universal equivalent. Of course, outside of our theoretical imagining of these commodity relations, accidental footballs don't actually govern our value relations. We don't just pick one at random and decide, this is it. In the material world, we have a different commodity that serves this function money. In this section, money is established as gold. In later chapters, Marx will argue how this came to be. But for now, we understand that gold, that still has both a use value and an exchange value, and is still a commodity, became the universal equivalent, the commodity that establishes a monopoly of worth over all other commodities. 
and that all other commodities are expressed in their reflection of gold's value. Something very important to remember here is that while we are considering all these commodities and their worth, including gold and money, what we are actually comparing is not just a physical commodity, but the labour process that is embodied within it to give it value. When we compare the worth of a commodity in relation to its expression in gold or money, we are actually comparing the physical human labour and the amount of time of labour that went into producing those commodities. Thus capitalism, its money form and its ever-expanding commodity production becomes the manifestation of all social relations and labour relations expressed as money. There is a physical relation between physical things, but it is different with commodities. There, the existence of the things, qua commodities, and the value relation between the products of labour, which stamps them as commodities, have absolutely no connection with their physical properties and with the material relations arising therefrom. There it is a definite social relation between men that assumes in their eyes the fantastic form of a relation between things. In this section, Marx discusses his well-known idea of the fetishism of commodities. Usually, hearing the word fetish, people relate it towards a sexual act or a sexual desire towards an object, but this is not what Marx is discussing. Let's try and establish what a fetish is then before continuing. Historically, a fetish is the name used for an item or object that various peoples would typically attach a religious or sacred sentiment towards. An object that they would pray to to ensure for good-looking war or ideal weather for crops or fishing, the birth of a male child perhaps. Whenever these situations became true, for them it happened because of their praying to the object. And likewise, if the war was a failure or a girl was born, it might be because they didn't pray enough or correctly to the object. To these people, the actual material moments in war or the environmental fluctuations in weather and fishing became partly hidden by their fetishization of the object. Marx here is applying this idea of the fetish towards capitalism and capital's value and social relations. When we have money in our hand, we very rarely think about it in any other way than what we can spend it on. It becomes a fetish to us. It hides the relation that money has to all other commodities and very successfully hides the social and labour relations towards the value that is embodied in the commodities and money that we exchange. It's quite hard to look at the coin in your hand and see how it's also very much directly related to the process of labour that is producing the value within it, or that all other commodity values and their labour are dictated by the value of the coin in your hand. Whether it's a man in a dangerous factory welding metal, a woman in a Malaysian sweatshop sewing clothes, children in Congo mining rare metals for mobile phones, or even the very labour you perform at your own place of work. This relationship between the material commodities and their value becomes hidden to us. This becomes further hidden by the fact that the vast majority of us only ever interact with commodities through a vast circulating global market and not directly with the people performing the labour. It was solely the analysis of the prices of commodities which led to the determination of the magnitude of value and solely the common expression of all commodities in money which led to the establishment of their character as values. Marx also comments on how the political economists of his time, and this is still very much true for today, are also fixated on this fetish. The economy becomes one focused on the commodities circulating throughout our markets and their exchange value, money, while completely ignoring the social and labour relations that produce the value. And so, under a capitalist mode of production, the world appears as an immense collection of commodities.